This is Vadim Krosnok, a media center Ukraine. I'd like to welcome all the journalists joining us to spread the truth about the key developments in Ukraine. Today, we'll be talking about Lithuania, one of the steadfastest friends of Ukraine. We have Petro Beshta with us, extraordinary and plenipotentiary ambassador of Ukraine to Lithuanian Republic. Petro, greetings, good, good day. And let us start with the assistance. Lithuania has been granted to Ukraine since the very first days of war up to now in numbers and facts. The most important thing when, that I realized uh, when I arrived in Lithuania was that Lithuanians are our long-standing key partner, a friend that knows and understands Ukraine closely tied with the far-reaching historic uh, ties uh, brought together by our common and shared past and present and a common enemy. We don't have a shared border. And uh, this country understands and helps Ukraine like one of the greatest uh, supporters. So now let us speak numbers and facts. Lithuania was the first country to deliver Stinger guns to Ukraine in February. That was cruelly critical important in the first days and weeks of war when the Western system was only on the way. But then Lithuania uh, collected a large uh, shipment of its stingers and shipped them to Ukraine. So the first uh, Russian fighter jets were brought down by Lithuanian stinger jets. Since then, Lithuania approved a sixth resolution these were statements made by the Lithuanian parliament in support of Ukraine. The first statement came out on the 24th of February when the war broke out. The whole country stood up, the leaders and the nation organized a major rally in the center of Vilnius and parliament rallied in support of Ukraine in the face of aggression from Russia and Belarus. Then more resolutions followed in support of Ukrainian membership in the EU that supported the protection of the Ukrainian infrastructure that uh, supported the embargo on energy supplies uh, from Russia. And recently, the day before yesterday, to be more specific, during the working visit of the Vice Speaker of Ukraine, Olena Kondratyuk, to the Parliament, the Lithuanian Parliament uh, approved the resolution deeming the contact of Russia in Ukraine an act of genocide. Therefore, Lithuania came the fourth country in the world to recognize uh, the deeds of Russia as an act of genocide. Moreover, Lithuania welcomed Ukrainian displaced people in numbers that make up 1.8 of their overall population. That is a very high number for a country like Lithuania, but it is still keeping its doors open to Ukrainians and giving them a warm welcome. Can you give us a rough number? It's over 50,000 Ukrainians that have found shelter in Lithuania. It may not be so big in absolute numbers, but considering that the population of Lithuania is 2.7 million, roughly the population of the city of Kiev, then 50,000 means a lot of people for the country, considering that they are working very hard to provide uh, high quality services to Ukrainians. That is an extensive number indeed. Let me mention that uh, the government, uh, the parties in Lithuania are helping Ukraine, but also there is a very strong front of volunteers that have very quickly rallied up their resources and have organized a number of incredible public projects. One is called Strong Together, and from the very first days of war, they decided that no Ukrainian should live uh, in some uh, public spaces, uh, and all Ukrainians uh, uh, and that is half of the Ukrainian displaced people were given a home. They're staying in families, in apartments and homes. And people are offered high quality food in the restaurants. And those are civic initiatives. Lithuania was the first to relinquish 
the purchases of Russian gas. So basically, Lithuania was the first to impose an oil and gas embargo on uh, uh, Russia. Lithuania was the first to announce the Russian ambassador persona non grata. That happened a month ago. The first foreign visits of the foreign governmental officials were made by Lithuania among the leaders. The Lithuanian minister visited Ukraine in the early days and the uh, Lithuanian defense ministers made uh, their visits to Ukraine in the early days of war. Petro, you mentioned the civic initiatives to help the Ukrainian refugees. There must be some governmental programs to assist Ukrainian refugees. Can you tell us more about them? For sure, the government uh, is uh, working hard uh, to accommodate Ukrainians, uh, same as uh, it accommodates the Lithuanian nationals. Ukrainians are given the status of temporarily displaced person for a year. They're given a place to stay. Mostly, they are put up with families uh, in separate homes or apartments. This uh, home is provided for free so that people wouldn't have to stay in dormitories, gyms, etc. Ukrainians immediately offered uh, free medical care. This is um, uh, the same care that the Lithuanian people are getting. They get uh, a benefit, uh, and uh, then they are getting a monthly benefit for their children. The children can attend uh, kindergartens and schools for free. Same applies to universities. Moreover, our uni students are paid out a scholarship to sustain them. And thirdly, Ukrainians have the right to land a job. And uh, this means that they can seek a job, land a job, and given their temporary permits, they can uh, register and uh, hold a formal job. We've actively reached out to the networks that allocated certain quotas for Ukrainian temporarily displaced persons to offer them employment, f to give them security. As of now, a third of adults, uh, uh, Ukrainian adults, uh, have uh, landed a job, they are earning about 900 euros on average, and a third are still seeking a job, and a third is perhaps undecided, as there is a psychological barrier for the Ukrainian, and uh, uh, Lithuanians are saying that Ukrainians are not uh, prepared to consider their stay in Lithuania for a very long term, and uh, seek a job because we all hope that the war will end soon and people hope to be able to go home very soon. So I have the next question to you. As far as I know, there are some Ukrainians still arriving in Lithuania and are you seeing a trend of people leaving Lithuania and how many are leaving Lithuania these days? In the recent weeks, not too many people arrived in Lithuania. Early it was about 500 people a day, but lately we've been following that uh, there are 500 Ukrainians who have registered their intent to return to Ukraine. We cannot verify whether they have returned indeed, but this is the trend that is beginning to manifest itself. And uh, our people that are planning to go back to the government, Ukrainian government-controlled territories, to the liberated territories where infrastructure is up and running, if they have a hope to go back to, then those people are considering the possibility of going back home. Oh, that is clear. That is uh, assuring. Petron, you mentioned that Lithuania recognized the Russian aggression an act of genocide. And the decision to deem Russia a rogue state, is that a separate decision? And how will it affect the situation? These are two different uh, decisions. The 
crime of genocide is an attempt of a nation to annihilate the other nation based on its ethnic uh, feature. And if you listen to the statements made by Putin and his entourage, they are peddling the statement that the Ukrainians have no entity, there's no Ukrainian nation, it shouldn't exist, it needs to be exterminated. So the genocide following the events in Bucha, in Irpin, Borodyanka, was for the whole world to see that this is not just a military action following the customs and laws of war, but this is a, a pervasive uh, war crime, and the uh, Russian army is exterminating anything in its path. Children, women, civilian infrastructure, this is not a war, this is uh, an explicit genocide intended to exterminate Ukrainian nation, language, history, culture, and Ukrainian state as such. To deem Russia a rogue state is a separate decision. Lithuania approved it on the 10th of May. There's a separate point stating that Lithuania, Lithuanian parliament, deem Russia a rogue state, a state a sponsor of a terrorist. Again, if a genocide is a very broad area and it's a grave uh, violation of law, the International Court uh, hears uh, military war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide is one such crime under their jurisdiction. This is a very grave charge showing that the state and its leadership have to be prosecuted and brought to justice internationally. The state sponsor of terrorism charge pertains to an additional number of sanctions and uh, uh, an impetus for other countries to impose greater sanctions on a country if it is deemed of being a sponsor of terrorism at the state level. Lithuania was one of the first countries to make such countries deem in Russia a rogue state. It's important in terms of sanctions, but also important in terms of setting the tone for the EU, as Lithuania has done when it showed leadership in the EU. And hopefully many other countries will follow suit, follow Lithuanian leadership. This is perfectly right. Lithuanian parliament recognized Russia, the state sponsor of terrorism. This is not a governmental statement, it's a parliamentary resolution, a political one, which is important because Lithuania as a country has made such recognition, and more importantly, it needs to propel the other states, both EU members and other countries, towards similar recognition. Lithuania, in all other respects, such as support for Ukraine's accession into the EU or NATO, Lithuania was the first to make the decisions and uh, lead by example, lobbying the decisions amongst other countries and coalitions. And that is critically important because someone needs to um, needs to take the charge, and Lithuania isn't um, wary of that uh, mission. That is very important to hear. Now let's talk about the European economy weaning itself of the cooperation with Russia. It is a critical matter for Ukraine and for the countries that know what the Russian Empire means and what threat is emanating from the Russian Empire, if in the early days of war, in the first weeks of war, Ukraine attempted to uh, try and negotiate to stop the war, now it's become apparent that uh, it would not be possible to stop the war on the previous terms, and we need to strive to undermine the Russian regime, its economy, its technical capacity, its military capacity, so that they wouldn't be able to 
create uh, threats to Ukraine and other Eastern European countries for a longer term. So this uh, sanction drive to levy financial technological sanctions is very important to keep up as it is uh, critical for all the areas that maintain the uh, aggression regime of aggression both the defense industry high technology industry is generating the profit and bringing revenues to the national budget so the entire europe and uh, uh, lithuania is amongst the leaders are rallying to sever all economic ties with Russia. Lithuania is doing it well. All major companies renounced doing business in Russia and have blocked uh, the operation of Russian companies in Lithuania. Uh, we hear you. Thank you so much for finding this opportunity to talk to us. Thank you for doing um, what you can to deepen our friendship to our steadfast friend and partner, the country of Lithuania. We had Petro Beshta, extraordinary and plenipotentiary ambassador of Ukraine to Lithuania. And the
This is Vadim Krasnoke reporting from Media Center Ukraine. I'd like to welcome all the journalists joining us to spread the truth about the key developments in Ukraine. Today we'll be talking about the situation at the border. Today we have Daniel Menchikov, acting head of Viv Customs, and Colonel Ihor Matvichuk, and Deputy Chief of Staff. Head of Border Control Organization Unit of the Western Regional Directorate. Let us start with the news from the border. As of yesterday, the new rules for the import of vehicles into Ukraine came into effect. So tell us why was that important to introduce. Good day. So a number of changes were introduced through the Ukrainian laws. Firstly, this is uh, the import of the vehicles purchased by Ukrainian nationals abroad. It's known that the simplified procedure for the import of uh, cars triggered colossal queues at the western borders of Ukraine in order to bypass uh, those queues for giving a high passage for the humanitarian relief that is needed in the central and eastern regions of Ukraine. To that effect, the government made a special resolution regulating the import of vehicles by Ukrainian nationals into the territory of Ukraine. Therefore, the drivers bringing in vehicles from Europe for free circulation through the simplified procedure will have to wait at the Viv Customs boarding crossing point Rushivko Domish. All the drivers are advised to go there if they are wishing to bring in vehicles for their use. This resolution was made by the Ukrainian government yesterday, and it's resolution number 354. Instead, all the other boarding crossing points of Lviv Customs, Smilnica, Uhryniv, Ravaruska, Cheheni, and Krakivets will continue operating all goods, primarily giving clearance for the humanitarian relief. Apart from Hrushiv at the Ukrainian-Polish border, which is part of the Lviv Customs Office, the list also includes Usteluch on the border with Poland. This is Volin Customs Office and Malay Berezny on the border with Slovakia. That's Zakarpatia Customs Office. Therefore, all the Ukrainian nationals wishing to bring in cars that they purchased in Europe into Ukraine for free circulation now have to go through Hrushev, Hodomysh, Ustuluch, and Mali Berezny of respectively Lviv, Volin, and Zakarpatia customs offices. Now, let us uh, discuss the situation at the Polish side of the border. Our counterparts are expediting the passage and clearance of humanitarian relief coming into Ukraine. To that end, a special site was created, pomahokraine.gov.pl. On this site, People wishing to expedite the clearance of humanitarian cargo can fill out their respective application. You can see the QR code on the screen, and this will take you to the application. The application would only take you a few minutes to fill out. Afterwards, the driver would get a confirmation certificate to bring in the humanitarian cargo. This document would entitle the document to bypass the queues and drive to the Ukrainian border. So the driver bringing in humanitarian cargo has to have the certificate, confirmation certificate with him. And driving on the Polish side, he should show it to the Polish border guards and the Polish police, and they will designate him to a special lane towards the customs uh, border crossing point. Kochevakra Kivets from Lviv Customs Office are working in this fashion, as well as Dorohusi Hutin of Volin Customs Office. Both are working in this mode. 
we are continuing discussions with our Polish colleagues so that these certificates could be used for all people bringing in humanitarian cargo to give to be given speedy passage through the border crossing points into Ukraine. And lastly, let me share the statistics about the operation of VIV Custom. Since the beginning of war, VIV Customs uh, documented 164,000 tons of humanitarian cargo, 13,000 vehicles for individuals, and a number of vehicles for the needs of the Ukrainian army. We'll be happy to welcome you at the uh, Customs Point. Tell us about the situation with the humanitarian cargo. Are people still queuing to bring them in, or are those um, procedures already working effectively, or are they only being tested out? The procedures are already in place, and I would like to thank the border guards of Ukraine and our Polish counterparts. We have succeeded in uh, managing the queues in a most effective and efficient manner so that humanitarian relief could reach the border, be cleared uh, efficiently, and be delivered to where it is needed most. Are you seeing tangible results? Yes, we are already seeing tangible results. Please stay at the podium, but please give the place at the micro microphone for Colonel Igor Matvichuk, Deputy Chief of Staff, Head of the Border Control Organization Unit of Western Regional Directorate. Greetings. Let's talk about uh, border crossing. How many people are leaving? How many people are entering the country? Good day. The recent numbers, the recent trends at the borders in the last two days have indicated that the number of people coming into Ukraine is uh, greater than those leaving the country. This is a positive trend overall. If we look at the numbers for the last two months, then there were 5 million people crossing the western stretch of the Ukrainian border. Most uh, people were leaving the country at the time, mostly children and women who were leaving the country. As for men, often we asked uh, about men, but uh, there are there are some allegations that conscription age uh, men are crossing the border, but those are mostly drivers recorded in Schlach application, bringing humanitarian goods or uh, delivering other international uh, in international consignments, and other men are those that fall under the exception, like the fathers of many children, people with disability, people accompanying uh, the wounded and the medics accompanying the patients, etc. Let's talk more about those um, exceptional categories, the men of conscription age that are free to cross the border. Are there any limitations that we need to know of? Look, all the information, and there's quite a lot of it, uh, is uh, available at the website of Lviv Border Service. There's a list, last updated on the 3rd of May. There's a list of documents. This, um, this is basically... Uh, this principle, since there's no formal regulation of the requirements, it is uh, left to the discretion of the border guards. And the more documents he can expect, the more assured he can, the person meets the requirement. Um, let us talk about this Schlach application for people delivering the humanitarian aid and international cargo. These individuals are registered, then uh, as they reach the border, the border guard would type in the passport number in his uh, software, and the software would upload the passport data and all the other data. If we know that the person is bringing humanitarian goods, and that is of critical importance, then we're giving him free passage. He would only need a foreign passport. The same applies for people returning home. As for others, uh, their fathers who have more than three children, they're eligible to cross the border. They need to have the certificate of this parent 
uh, and uh, the children have to be minors less than 18 years of age or it could be a marriage certificate and birth certificates of the children if the children come from different families then there is a question of um, the children being dependent and if we know the children are dependent on this man then uh, the man will be allowed to cross the border if the man has lost his uh, parental rights or let's say uh, it's the contrary situation that a um, mother of the child has passed away or has been uh, has lost uh, her parental rights that would make the man eligible so uh, in any situation we upload the data analyze it and make the situation make the decision now uh, we are receiving a lot of referrals from the students studying abroad and those studying in ukraine and they keep asking can they cross the border so the exception is made for those studying abroad so that they continue their studies in foreign universities this was uh, formulated in the decisions of the military leadership of ukraine they need uh, uh, two sets of documents they need uh, a certificate from the conscription sector it's a definite uh, certificate that his mobility mobilization is deferred uh, because of his studies and that he is given a right to travel abroad and he can have this um, so-called military ticket with a deferral on it this is one set of documents and secondly he needs to provide documents that he followed a course of study and uh, is intending to continue his course of study in a foreign universities these would be documents from a university with translation of them it's very important to know the university and it has to be um, a full course of uh, tuition it can't be um, a part-time study or anything else so it's important that we know that the person is uh, planning to travel to complete the study started before the war what about people with disabilities what documents are needed for those people to travel people with uh, limited uh, abilities uh, could be two categories people with disability and people who need additional care uh, family uh, can travel with the person with disability it could be father or son mother or daughter and they don't need any further documents all they need uh, is a confirmation that they have the disability of the first and uh, second group and uh, documents to show family collection if they're traveling together and this um support is the key if the person needs care but they don't have the status of a person with disability then that person needs to have a finding of a medical commission that they are in need of care and the person accompanying them needs a certificate or some other document let's say a note that they are receiving financial assistance to provide care and then the caregivers are given passage across the border thank you there's another question that must be a concern for many thinking about crossing the border. It is uh, whether there are multiple queues and which border crossing points are freer than others. Are any cameras that we can use to follow that? Well, the situation with queues uh, changes uh, uh, dramatically. As Daniel was saying, day by day the queues uh, a change some border crossing points um, um, that were noted by Deniel as those designated to bring in the vehicles brought abroad will be most uh, packed as for other border crossing points there are no significant queues uh, at most they can um, evolve and take an hour or two um, uh, in Volin uh, region it's Yahudin uh, in Viv it's Ravaruska Shaheni in Chernivtsi it's Porubne 
in Zakarpatia is Ujhar. These are traditional border crossing points where we are seeing greatest traffic of passengers and uh, uh, cargo. So there could be 200 to 500 cars waiting. Can we follow the situation in real time? Since uh, the implementation of the Marshall's Law, the cameras have been blocked for obvious reasons. So the cameras are not working on the Ukrainian side. I could only say that uh, currently uh, on the Facebook page of the Western Regional Board, we are giving references for the informational sources of our neighbors where you can follow the queues on their side of the borders. So you can follow the statistics and watch the cameras in real time. So please go to the Facebook page of the uh, Western Regional Directorate for that information. We have a do we have any questions uh, from the audience? We have a person representing the border guards and uh, the customs uh, service. I see he Bakov. Tell us how has uh, the import of fuel changed to Ukraine? We hear this statement from the Ministry of Infrastructure and the Ministry of Transport of Poland. And during the last fuel energy forum in Warsaw, an agreement was made to ramp up the imports of Ukraine from 60 to 220 tons on a monthly basis. Are you sensing the tangible changes or not? And when can we expect that the Ukrainian gas stations will not be short on fuel? Thank you for this question. Currently, there are no problems with bringing in fuel to Ukraine. Both. Uh, our Polish colleagues and ourselves have found a solution to bring in fuel to Ukraine on a speedy um, basis. This is the first part of your question. Secondly, the question about the Ministry of Infrastructure and Ministry of Economy, what they're doing to prevent a fuel crisis in Ukraine. So the decisions that they brought in are making uh, the supply of fuel to Ukraine much easier and faster. Some documents, some limitations were lifted for bringing fuel into Ukraine. When will this fuel shortage end in Ukraine? That is not for me to predict, but I'm certain that is going to happen quickly because Ukraine and our partners are working very hard to resolve this matter. Well, we hope to see it happen very soon. Uh, I would like to uh, make a note on behalf of the Border Guard Service. We are giving priority to the fuel tankers. A week has gone by, and whether they are full or empty, going into Ukraine or leaving Ukraine, are given top priority. They're given separate lanes. They're not facing any impediments at the border. I will not uh, give you the numbers. I don't have the right to give you the numbers, but the numbers are extensive. And I know that uh, the crisis will be overcome soon. That is very reassuring to hear. And it's good that at the border, uh, coming from the customs and the border guards, we hear the statement that we can expect the fuel crisis to be resolved soon and the delays will not happen at the border. Thank you for this. Do we have any more questions? Daria Kuchev, Tvoje Misto. Tell us, uh, what's the situation with the exports at the customs now that the seaports have been blocked and the customs are clearing all the export flows? Are you coping with the flows? Are any queues of the uh, trailer trucks bringing the uh, commodities abroad. Indeed, we're seeing that our economy is beginning to work around the Marshall's Law and is beginning to find solutions that are workable in wartime. And indeed, the exports are ramping up. Now that the ports have been blocked, we've seen that the traffic of Ukrainian commodities going abroad is increasing. And the customs 
service along the entire western stretch of the Ukrainian border are working hard to make sure the experts can reach the destination countries as soon as they can. And this is controlled by the central office and by the government. So we are clearing the experts and expediting their passage across the border. Can you give us some numbers of the increase in experts in the last month? And the experts reached 236,000 tons last month. Compared to the previous month, it grew by 30%. This month is still in progress. And every month, Ukrainian Customs is reporting on the dynamics of chain, uh, dynamics of import and export. And you can see the numbers for the end of the month. And I can predict that there's going to be significant increase. Would it make sense to build more border crossing points? Is there a reason to bring in more? Uh, customs officials to the border to expedite the passage. As for uh, building new border crossing points, this government, the government is considering these uh, solutions. Some uh, developments have been made, some negotiations have already been launched, and we'll inform you the, um, fi about the final decision. And we can bring in more custom officials when we have new uh, border crossing points. But so far, the custom officials are coping well. And one last question, what, uh, how many tons of humanitarian relief passed the borders since 24? 64,000 tons have passed through the Lviv customs traveling into Ukraine. Are there more questions? Roxolana Bocera, Radio Svoboda, Radio Freedom, do you know how many vehicles were cleared since the zero custom duty on vehicles and how many of them were procured for the army do you have the numbers and at for the resolution of the cabinet of ministers is it a recommendation that the three uh, border crossing points will do the customs clearance or is it a binding option thank you since the war broke out the 7,000 vehicles were brought in as humanitarian assistance for the needs of the Ukrainian army. According to the law, expediting the clearance of the vehicles and in Lviv, particularly, this was 13,000 such vehicles. The Resolution of the government on the limitation of import of vehicles into Ukraine, the vehicles that were first procured in Europe, makes sense in my opinion, because the eastern and central regions of Ukraine are needing the humanitarian relief and they shouldn't be blocked by the vehicles waiting for clearance. This resolution, is it recommendational or binding? Would people, uh, should people go to other border crossing points? Should they be penalized in any way? The people will only be allowed to clear the vehicles in Hrushi border crossing point. More questions? Good day, I'm the Yuri Lukashevsky, I'm a Lviv city councillor, and I have two questions, two difficulties that I faced this very weekend, so I wanted to clarify. The border crossing point Krakivet has a very multi-kilometer queue, and as the vehicles entered Ukraine, I observed the following. There is a queue for clearing the vehicles, and there is a separate queue for the uh, entrance of the uh, trucks and the two queues merge at the waiting point creating a huge bottleneck uh, preventing passage of cars and usually it's uh, two trucks followed by a vehicle and this is a major delay for the trucks bringing in humanitarian relief and petrol as well as for the individual cars and there's just one customer's official processing the queue why such a setup let me answer your question 
there's one customer official processing the queue. Uh, this allegation is not uh, accurate. I've uh, seen the situation firsthand. As for the waiting of the ve the vehicles are not weighted. The individuals' cars are not weighted. And as of yesterday, the vehicles will not be allowed passage on Krakivets if they were procured abroad. And uh, I hope this is settled. Then I have a plea. If you could please verify the information. I'm the eyewitness of the situation when the individual's cars would have to drive uh, following their trucks to the same lane with the waiting, going through the same control. I experienced it firsthand uh, Sunday morning. Please uh, look into that. You may not know of this operational situation that evolved over the weekend, but it's important because the queue uh, was extensive and there was major delay. I will personally look into it and uh, uh, settle it. And I have the second question. If people are bringing in uh, vehicles for the army as charitable or as uh, humanitarian relief, do they need to go to the designated border crossing points uh, or can those vehicles uh, uh, be cleared um, through other border crossing points? The vehicles brought in as uh, humanitarian relief for the army, no limitations are imposed, so they can drive up and the Polish party will allow passage, be that Kakivets or Ravaruska or any other point. This is, this is exactly the case. My recommendation is the vehicles designated as humanitarian relief for the army should go to Hrynev or Smilnica, as they have the less uh, turnover compared to other border crossing points. But should you go to Ravarusko, Krakivets, bring in humanitarian relief for the army, it will still be given a speedy passage. Thank you. Are there more questions? Victoria Aspen, Zahidnet. Do you know about the lengthy queues on the Polish side of the border of the vehicles that haven't been brought in before yesterday that arrived in Krakowice and Shugini show what should they do now as they've been waiting for days in the gray zone and they don't know whether they should turn around and go to Hrushev or will it be cleared on an exceptional basis what should they be doing uh, we should handle each case on a case-by-case -case basis, and that's what we do. We try to accommodate as far as we can. We try to uh, meet the people's need. We continue clearing the vehicles that have been uh, um, declared before we check the documents, uh, and we try to accommodate. So people that are waiting in the queues uh, that they are queuing over the weekend will still be able to clear a Chahini. Yes, they will, but I recommend that they turn around and go to Rushiv instead. Are there more questions? There are no further questions. Then let us thank the border guards and the custom officers. We had Daniel Menchikov, the acting head of VIF Customs, and Colonel Ihor Matvichuk, Deputy Chief of Staff, Head of Border Control Organization Unit of the Western Regional Directorate. Thank you for staying with us. Thank you for sharing the
I'm Vadim Krasnooki, for Media Center Ukraine. Today, we shall discuss the evacuation of the civilians from the areas of hostilities. With us, we have Tetiana Lomakina, Humanitarian Corridor Coordinator with the President Office. Tetiana, greetings. Greetings. So, Humanitarian Corridors. They have been in place, but are operational no longer. Can we hope to see them reinstituted in the short term? Indeed, recently with the support of the UN and with the support of International Committee for the Red Cross, about 300 people were rescued from Azol Stavl, steelworks, mostly women and children. Now, negotiations are in progress about the second important stage of the humanitarian operation, the evacuation of the medics and the wounded, about 500 people, and the opening of the humanitarian corridors that the residents of Mariupol need. There are 100,000 people remaining in Mariupol. They are mostly elderly and children. They are waiting for rescue, and Ukraine will do its utmost to operate the humanitarian corridors and help people be able to leave the safer areas in Ukraine. Donbass is the hottest spot. The governor of Luhansk was saying that now it's not possible to evacuate the people any longer because of the threat. Uh, can some evacuation corridors still be organized? You mentioned that you had cooperated with you and the Red Cross. Could perhaps uh, this solution be applied for Luhansk? Indeed, uh, the situation in Donetsk and Luhansk is incredibly complex. The Russian army uh, is intensifying its assault and uh, are relentlessly pummeling the residential areas. There is. Uh, Little we can do to provide humanitarian relief and evacuation is very difficult. In order to open the humanitarian corridors, we need to negotiate a ceasefire. And this is what our group will be demanding in order to restore the evacuation of people so that they can leave for safer areas in Ukraine. Let us discuss other regions now. Let us talk about Donbass, Donetsk, and Mariupol, and other settlements. Are there any differences on the ground there? I would say that my answer is yes. It is all hinging on the line of contact, moving and humanitarian corridor can be put in motion. Once a route is defined, then it is discussed with the military and political leadership of the Russian Federation with the mediation of the Red Cross International Committee. And either we get a confirmation or we don't, unfortunately, and then we uh, resume negotiating without the safeguards or the guarantees to give safe passage for the people in the areas of military operation, um, we cannot act otherwise. Is the situation in Kherson region similar? As the governor of Kherson stated, there are people wanting to leave Kherson for Ukraine, but mostly people are leaving by their own cause. Uh, so, seemingly, uh, no agreement can be reached with the Russians via mediators or otherwise. Would you comment on this? Uh, it is Ukraine that is interested in operating the humanitarian corridors. We want to give a chance to our people to reach safety. Meanwhile, Russians don't have an interest in pursuing this goal, so they do everything uh, to uh, obstruct the passage of the humanitarian coin, which is a blatant violation of the international humanitarian law, which we are evidencing, and we are raising the question at the United Nations Organization as it constitutes the violations of the customs and laws of war. And uh, it is for the international organizations to intervene as well. 
Well, the international organizations are intervening, but can you say that there is light at the end of the tunnel and humanitarian corridors will be operating in a more sustainable fashion anywhere along the line of contact? We are hopeful. It's very difficult to predict uh, the outcome of the negotiations before we start the negotiations. We take your answer. Tatiana, thank you. Let us discuss the following. Mariupol has seen uh, the evacuation of a uh, dozen thousand people who have been taken to safety, but they need uh, a roof over their head. They need uh, psychological assistance, medical assistance to rehabilitation, adaptation. Is there any targeted program that would cater to their needs? Currently, there are humanitarian hubs deployed in all the rear territories in the welcoming communities of Ukraine, receiving the people leaving the area of operations, and their people have access to shelter, they have access to financial assistance, and they have food provided for them from the international organizations and from the welcoming communities too. Down Mariupol, municipality is developing a separate program to support the residents of Mariupol. These are Mariupol hubs, and they've been opened in Dnipro, Zaporizhia, and they're planning to evolve such hubs, and they will provide specific aid to the residents of Mariupol on legal aid, on psychological assistance, and uh, help them restore the documents and help them find jobs. So these are the important uh, elements of support that people need um, in their plight, and people are beginning to uh, cope with the shock that they've experienced, they're beginning to come around, and they uh, have very specific needs and questions that they need to address. So uh, support is on the way for the residents of Mariupol, what but what about the residents of other towns and cities? They could benefit from psychological assistance and employment assistance as well. Are there any centralized programs to help them based on some territorial principle or the national programs? Are there any in place? Exactly. There's the national program. So if the person is uh, on the way to the temporary home, they will be met at the railway station by the representatives of the welcoming towns and communities, helping them find shelter, find a place to stay. We firstly make sure people have a roof over, the, over their head, have a place to stay. And uh, there are centers uh, for the evacuees that are helping out with that concern. And then People can be put up in a family, or people can rent a home, or people can stay in the humanitarian hub for the evacuees. And this is when the psychological aid would uh, reach out to the people, and other services would reach out as well, helping people shape up their life. There is food organized for the people so that people have time to recover and uh, feel uh, care, protection, and security. Thank you. Tatiana, thank you for this opportunity to talk to us. We are wishing you every success in your daunting task of organizing humanitarian quarters, but which is vitally important. And thank you for doing what you do. This was Tatiana Lomakina, the humanitarian quarter coordinator with the president Office. I'm with them, Krasnoki, for Media Center Ukraine.